We're making a dynamic invoice generator in Excel today. Check this out. It's going to create an invoice automatically. Either of these buttons, I'll show you how to do both of them. They do the same thing. They generate a PDF invoice and they're saving it to my desktop right now. It's got all the information here. And it's also, after the fact, clearing everything out. So it gives me a message that it generated the PDF. And now it's cleared out the bill to address, all the items, the discount, if any, that we had. And it's also incremented the order number. I don't know if you noticed that, but right over here, we've got 10014 for our order number. And let me close the PDFs. Now we got 10015. So that's pretty handy, a little extra feature that we've got programmed in here. Let's get into how we built this. First thing we have is a bunch of data on a data tab. So I've got a list of items. This would be our inventory, whatever it is we're selling. I chose coffee for this example. I plugged in some coffees, descriptions, and prices, formatted as a table. You don't even have to do that, but I like to. Then I've done the same thing for our customers. We got name, address, city, state, zip, and email. And finally, another table here for discounts, if we choose to offer a discount where we can plug in these percentage amounts. And then finally at the bottom, not formatted in a table, is just this long sequence of numbers. So this is where I'm getting my invoice numbers from. And the first column right here, these check boxes, that's how I'm controlling how it increments. So I'm X looking up the next value that's not checked. And we'll get into that here in just a minute. Let's build our form. Let's talk about what's going on here. So first of all, I've gotten rid of the grid lines up in the view tab. You can do VG from your keyboard or uh, just click this little box right here to toggle grid lines on and off. Just looks more professional with those off. And then getting straight into the invoice, we'll just take it top to bottom and talk about how this is built. I've got a little icon here, which I didn't even know this was a thing. So if you go Alt N for insert, you can insert a picture in a cell and then we've got stock images, which I, again, I didn't know we could do this. And there's illustrations, stickers, cartoon people, all sorts of stuff in here. So I found a sticker. I think this was a sticker that I'm using for a coffee image. Got invoice typed over here, bill to, and then right here is our first piece of dynamic information. So this is our customer list. We click this drop down list and we got all the customers. When I select one, then it pops in their address right underneath here. So this is very simply some data validation. If we Alt A for the data tab and then go VV for the data validation, we can see that this is a list, which that's what it is, a drop down list from a source of names. And the names source comes from this data tab right here. I've simply named this range. And to name a range, the shortcut to get there is uh, Control F3, and you can click New, and then you name that range. You can see right here that I've got names uh, as the range here, and that's for this customer's name in the table. Okay, that's how we're getting the name, but then under here, we're using XLOOKUP to return the address. So the first thing it's doing is looking at C5, and if it doesn't equal nothing, then I'm going to use an XLOOKUP. But if it does equal nothing, I'm returning a empty string there at the end. So the XLOOKUP is just taking that customer name, and let's put one in here. It's looking for the customer name in C5, and then it's looking it up in the customer's name table. And then it's returning the customer's address column from that same table. And if it doesn't find one, it's gonna say customer not found, add to customer list. And that's kind of a double whammy because you can see it, it'll say that in C6, but it's also the data validation will not allow EA to stay there. So we we'll just cancel that and it'll revert back to Emelin. Emelin, that's a cool name. All right, we're doing the same thing for city state address. We're just concatenating the return values. So I've got customer city and we're using this concatenation operator, the ampersand to throw in a comma, then the state, then an empty space and actually two spaces. You know, you're supposed to use two spaces between state and zip code. Yeah, that's a thing. And then we're returning the zip code. 
Okay, so that's how we get those. And we do one more XLOOKUP for the email address in the same way. On the column over here in E, we've got just information about our coffee shop, that website, an email address, and then an invoice number right here, invoice date, which is getting the today's date, payment due, which is just using a plus 14, so two weeks from now, and then an amount due, which is simply pulling the value from down here at the bottom, which we'll calculate in a minute. Let me show you this trick for invoice number though, and it's not much of a trick. All we're doing is looking up the value false from those check boxes, and we're returning the invoice number. So over here, I did some more named ranges for check boxes, and that's A26 through A25, and then the invoices, which is B26 through B25. So I've just named those ranges, so I look up the false value because XLOOKUP is gonna return the first false value. So once I check this guy right here for uh, 10015, Look at that, it's gonna return 10016 because that's simply the next one in sequence. It goes top to bottom by default and looks for the next value, the next match. All right, so that's how we're getting it and I'll show you how we set up the check boxes to automatically check here when we get into the VBA code because that's cool and I had to figure that out myself when I built this. All right, let's go down here to our C column in C13. Here's where we can pull our items, and we're doing the same thing that we did for our customers. We're just pulling in with data validation a drop down list of our items. So, again, Alt A V V, and we're getting a list of all these origins, which is what I've named the coffee column right here. All right, so let's put a couple of these in to give us a couple things to work with. And the only thing we have to do then is select the quantity. So it's not gonna calculate anything yet until I put in two here, four there, and then it's gonna give me amounts, subtotals, and total at the bottom. And it's doing that by simply using more X lookup. So we're first checking in another way by using is blank to see if the item row or the item column is blank. And if it is, we're returning an empty string. So we don't want a price here to be looked up if there's nothing to look it up, right? So I delete that, this goes away, this goes away. Let's put it back in. We get our price from an X lookup. We're using the C13 value, the item, looking up in that coffees table and returning the price. Simple stuff. The amount is simply, if this is blank, we're gonna return an empty string again, but if it's not, we're multiplying, right? So quantity times price, basic. I've got these all drug all the way down so we can have up to this many items. You can create different sized invoices if you had different size or different numbers of rows that you needed to dictate here. All right, so now subtotal is easy. We're just subtotaling all the amounts right here, every line. Uh, discount, what are we doing here? Well, let's look at this green box. Let's put a discount in. And now if we use your awesome as a discount, if this is not blank, then we're going to X look up C27, which is you are awesome, in the discounts table and return the discount amount. So down here, if you recall, here's the discount, here's the amount. Most of this is X lookup stuff. So now we've returned that 15% discount. We got tax built in here and I'm displaying this only if these two things are true if the subtotal is greater than zero, so if I've got items on the invoice, and if F27 is less than one, if that discount is less than 100% is basically what it's saying. Because if there's a 100% discount, watch this. Your family is 100% discount, well, we're not gonna tax zero, so we're just gonna leave the tax line off. Let's put uh, your awesome back on, 15% tax, or 15% discount, 9.25 tax, and now we just need to total things up. Now, I've gone an extra step and done more named ranges for the subtotal and for the discount amount, just so it's more clear in this formula that I wrote. But what we're doing is we're checking two conditions. If both these things are true, if that subtotal, again, is greater than zero, and the discount amount is less than one, which remember percentages are 
uh, zero to one. So 100% is just the number one. If both those things are true, then we're going to take the subtotal and subtract the subtotal times the discount. So if I got 113 bucks, I'm going to subtract the discount. To find the discount, I'm going to multiply 113 times 15%, and that's how we get that amount. And then we're going to add tax in. And to add tax, we do one plus the tax amount. So it'd be 1.0925. And I could hard code that in, but I left it here in the formula. And I'm going to multiply that subtotal minus the discount by the tax amount to get our grand total. And the grand total is returned up here at the top in this bold line. Typically, you'll see that at the top of an invoice. Okay, that's, that's kind of easy potato stuff, right? How did we do all the fancy uh, buttons and everything? Well, we'll make the button after we make the VBA code. And to do the VBA code, we're going to open this and don't get overwhelmed. If you want to just grab this, I'll make it available somehow. Grab a link in the description below. I'll either link straight to this or throw it in the description uh, raw like this. But I want to walk through what's happening. VBA is confusing. Uh, it can be. It is to me. I'm not as familiar with this as I am with stuff like JavaScript or Python because it's not as readable to me without going too much into the weeds. But to also give you a basic overview of what's going on in VBA, we've got this subroutine defined at the very top print area to PDF. That's like a function if you're familiar with other programming languages. This is just defining what we want to happen between that top line and down here at the bottom where it says end sub. So all this is running when we run this function. I'm going to call it a function. It's a subroutine. We're setting a bunch of variables and we're allocating space for it. So we're defining dim ws as a worksheet. This file path is a string, so forth and so on. And then down here, we're setting these WS and WS2 as these two worksheets. So we're pulling in our invoice tab and our data tab by using this workbook.sheets invoice and this workbook.sheets data. We're getting values from a couple cells to use in the file name. So invoice number and client ref are found in F7 and C5 from this first invoice workbook. We're setting a file path as my desktop for the sake of this video. And further on, we're going to make sure that location exists. We're creating a file name. So using file name and then using inside of this, the invoice number and client ref. And this is overkill, but I left it in as a suggestion in case there's a chance you have invalid characters in your file name, which we won't in our example, but it would replace them with an empty string so that it wouldn't throw an error for the file name. Then right here, we're going to make sure the directory exists. So we're going to throw the file name in. We're going to have it look for a, a directory or a file path. And if it's not there, like if desktop didn't exist in this location, then it would make dir file path. And that just makes that folder. Uh, right down here, we're going to use all these parameters to export the PDF. This is where like the meat of it happens. Not all these are necessary. It even says right here, I've written optional set properties if needed. We're setting the zoom to false, fit to pages. Uh, we've actually defined a print area that will print just fine without these. But here are the parameters if you need to use them or change them. Then we're going to export as fixed format. So right here, this is the main method that exports this file. The type specifies that we want it to be a PDF. The complete file path is right here. We're combining that file path with the file name. This defines the quality we want for the PDF. If you've saved PDFs in other programs, sometimes you can select the quality. You got minimum, standard, or maximum. We're using standard here. The include doc properties, that'll pull in values like the author name and the date and stuff from the Excel options. And we're just going to let that be included in the PDF options. And then the last two are self-explanatory. Ignore print area is false. So that's, use, that's saying, hey, use the print area, which we did and then open after publishing true so we can see it right after it opens. Right after that happens, we're going to clear the contents of C5 and C13 through D27. Those are the ranges where our customer is and where all the items and quantities are. Then finally, the last thing for each cell in WS2 range A26 through A25, where's that? Where's that? 
Remember WS2 is the data tab. So if I go to the data tab, that is this checkbox column. So this is how we are actually going in here and incrementally checking the next checkbox. So for each value in that range, it's going to check if this value is false, then it's gonna change it to true and then exit. But if it's not false, then we're gonna loop back through. So it's check, 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 checking. And for all the ones that are already checked, it's just gonna keep going to the next one until it finds one that's not checked. Then it's gonna check it and exit that loop. And finally, we're gonna display this mes message box saying that, hey, the PDF has been created and it displays the file name. So once again, let's go back over here and I'll use this button right here this time and you can see it pops open the PDF and then it has this message box right here. Okay, the last piece is just creating these buttons, right? Well, the first way that you can do it is go to the developer tab, insert, and then under form controls, there's a button, all right? So we just draw a button right here. As soon as you draw it, it'll say macro name and you click that one right there. If you have multiple subroutines, multiple macros defined, you can click a different one. All right, so if I right click this, I can edit the text and change that to whatever I want. And that's how we create one button. So in order to move this around, if I click it, it's gonna click it. But if I right click it, it pops up the outline around it and then I can just move, click regular and move it around. So we got another option that I kind of like better than the developer tab. Just go to insert, pop in a shape. We'll use the rounded rectangle. Double click in here, put a title on there. You can format it however you so please and get the text just the way you like it. The shape format is available to you so you can pick from several different preordained styles. There's one right there so it looks like a button. And in order to make it clickable, we will assign a macro just like we assigned a macro to the developer tab button. And there's our function or our subroutine that we're going to click OK on. And once again, you can see that that button functions exactly the same way as the developer tab button. If you like this, I know you'll like this next video. Click here to find out several different ways to search inside of an Excel workbook where we combine some different built-in functions and filtering in order to make your life a lot more efficient. I'll see you there.